Indian Pete's Christmas Gift by Herbert W. Collingwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The moon was just peeping over the pines as Pete Shivershe slunk down the road from the lumber camp into the forest. Pete did not present a surpassingly dignified appearance as he skulked through the clearing, but he was not a very dignified person even at his best. Most persons would have said, I think, that Pete's method of departure was hardly appropriate for one who had been selected by the citizens of Carter's camp to go on an important mission. But Pete had his own reasons for his actions. He crept along behind the stumps and logs till he reached the forest. Then, as if the shadow gave him fresh courage and dignity, he drew himself upright, and started at a sharp trot down the road toward the village. We have said that Pete had reasons for his conduct. They were good ones. In the first place, he was an Indian. Not a noble son of the forest, such as Cooper loved to picture, but a mean, dirty, yellow-faced Injun. Lazy and worthless, picking up a living about the lumber camps, working as little as he could, and eating and drinking as much as possible, such was the messenger. The mission was worse yet. It was Christmas Eve. The snow covered the ground, and the ice had stilled for the time the mouth of the roaring river. It was Saturday night as well, and for some time past the lumbermen had been considering the advisability of keeping the good old holiday with some form of celebration suited to the occasion. The citizens of Carter's camp were not remarkably fastidious. They knew but one form of celebration, and they had no thought of hunting out new ones. The one thing needful to make a celebration completely successful was liquor. This they must have in order to do justice to the day. The temperance laws of Carter's were very strict. Not that the moral sentiment of the place was particularly high, but it had been noticed that the amounts of labor and whiskey were in inverse proportion. The more whiskey, the less labor. It was a pure question of political economy. The foreman had often stated that he would prosecute to the fullest extent of the law the first man caught bringing whiskey into the camp. The foreman did not attempt, perhaps, to deny that his knowledge of the law was somewhat crude. He had forcibly stated, however, that should a case be brought before him, he would himself act as judge and jury, while his fist and foot would take the place of witness and counsel. There was something so terrible in this statement coming as it did from the largest man in camp, that very little whiskey had thus far been brought in. Christmas had come, and the drinking element in Carter's camp proposed that Pete Shivershe, the engine, be sent to town for a quantity of the liquid poison, that the drinkers might enjoy themselves. Bill Gammon found Pete curled up by the stove. He took him out of doors and explained the business in hand. Bill prided himself somewhat on his ability to get work out of engines. Pete muttered only, All right. He took the money Bill gave him and then slunk away down the road for the forest as we have seen him. Bill felt so confident of the success of his experiment that he did not hesitate to inform the boys that Pete was dead sure to return. He would stake his reputation on it. Pete was in a hard position. If he loved anything in this world, it was whiskey. If there was anything he feared, it was Bill's fist. The two were sure to go together. The money jingling in his pocket suggested unlimited pleasures, but over every one hung Bill's hard fist. He ran several miles through the forest, till, turning a corner of the road, he came upon a little clearing, in which stood a small log house. Pete knew the place well. Here lived Jeff Hunt with his wife, a French woman, and their troop of children. Jeff was a person of little importance by the side of his wife, though, like all lords of creation, he considered himself the legal and proper head of the family, as well as one of the mainstays of society. His part of the family government consisted, for the most part, in keeping the house supplied with wood and water, and in smoking his comfortable pipe in the corner, while his wife bent over her tub. 
Mrs. Hunt was the only woman near the camp, and so all the laundry work fell to her. Laundry work in the pine woods implies mending and darning, as well as washing and ironing, and the poor little woman had her hands full of work, surely. It was rub, 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 day after day, over the steaming tub, with the children running about like little wolves, and Jeff kindly giving his advice from his comfortable corner. And even after the children were in bed at night, she must sit up and mend the clean clothes. What a pack of children there were! How rough and strong they seemed, running about all day, all but poor little Marie, the oldest. She had never been strong, and now at last she was dying of consumption. She could not sit up at all, but lay all day on the little bed in the corner, watching her mother with sad, beautiful eyes. The brave little Frenchwoman's heart almost failed her at times, as she saw how day by day the little form grew thinner, the eyes more beautiful, the cheeks more flushed. She knew the signs too well, but there was nothing she could do. Pete was a regular visitor at Jeff's, and always a welcome one. His work was to carry the washing to and from camp. He came nearer to feeling like a man at Jeff's house than at any other place he knew of. Everyone but Mrs. Hunt and the little Marie called him only Injun, but they always said Mr. Shivershee. The Mr. Shivershee of the little Frenchwoman was the nearest claim to respectability that Pete felt able to make. One night, while carrying home the clothes, he dropped them in the mud. He never minded the whipping Bill Gammon gave him half as much as he did poor Mrs. Hunt's tears, to think how her work had gone for nothing. As Pete came trotting down the road, Jeff stood in front of his house chopping stovewood from a great log. A lantern hung on a stump provided light for his purpose. Pete stopped from sheer force of habit in front of the house, and Jeff, glad of any chance to interrupt his work, paused to talk with him. "'Walk in, Injun,' said Jeff hospitably. "'Your clothes ain't quite ready, but the woman will have em all up soon. Walk in.' It suddenly came over Pete that this was his night for taking the clothes home, but his present errand was of far more importance than mere laundry work. "'Me no stop. I go into ter town. Great work. Large business.' by which vague hints he meant no doubt to impress Jeff with a sense of the dignity of his mission, yet cunningly to keep its object concealed. "'Going to town be ye? Great doin's ter camp ter morrow, I suppose. I'll be round if I can get away, but walk in, Injun, and get your supper and see the women.' And Jeff opened the door for Pete to pass in. The thought of supper was too much for Pete, and he slunk in after Jeff and stood in the corner by the door. The room was hardly an inviting one, and yet if Pete had been a white man, some thoughts of home sweet home must have passed through his mind, but he was only a despised Injun. A rough board table was laid for supper at one side of the room. In the corner little Marie lay with the firelight falling over her poor thin face. Pete must have felt, as he looked at her, like some hopeless convict gazing through his prison bars upon some fair saint passing before him. She seemed to be in another world than his. There seemed between them a gulf that could not be bridged. Three of the larger children were sobbing in the corner, while the rest formed a sorrowful group about an old box in which were two or three simple plants, frozen and yellow. Mrs. Hunt was frying pork over the hot stove. As she looked up at Pete, he noticed that she had been crying. Jeff was the very prince of hosts. He made haste to make Pete feel at home. Set by, Injun! So the boys is going to kinder celebrate tomorrow, be they? But Pete felt that his mission must not be disclosed. What matter is with kids? he asked, to change the subject. Oh, they're just a yellin' about them flowers, explained Jeff. You see, they have been a trainin' some posies outdoors against tomorrow, you see. Tomorrow's Christmas, you see, and them kids they had an idee they'd have some flowers for to decorate that corner where the little gal is. Little gals, when they ain't well, like such things, you know. Pete nodded. He was not aware of this love of diminutive females, but it should not show very good breeding to appear ignorant. Well, you see, continued Jeff, they kept the flowers away from the little gal, meaning to surprise her like. But just this afternoon they got catched by the frost, and now there they be stiffer and stakes. It is kinder bad, ain't it, especially as it's Christmas, too? What Christmas? put in Pete. Oh, Christmas, well, it's sorter day, like, uh, it's something like other days, and yet it ain't. But then, Injun, I don't suppose you would understand if I was to tell you. 
and Jeff concealed his own ignorance, as many wiser and better men have done, by assuming a tone too lofty for his audience. But Mrs. Hunt could explain, even if Jeff could not. She paused on the way to the stove with a dish of pork in her hand. "'It is the day of the good Lord, Mr. Shivershi. It is the day when the good Lord he was born, and when all the people should be glad.' But the little woman belied her own creed as she thought of little Marie and the dead flowers. I hardly think Pete gained a very clear idea of the day even from Mrs. Hunt's explanation. It was, I fear, all Greek to him. "'What flowers fur?' he asked, as in response to Jeff's polite invitation he sat by and began supper. "'Well, it's sorter idea of the women,' explained Jeff. "'Looks kinder pooty to see the flowers round, you see, kinder slicks up a room-like. All these things has to come into keepin' house, you see, Injun. With which broad explanation Jeff helped himself to a piece of pork. But Mrs. Hunt was bound to explain, too. Her explanation was certainly more poetic. "'It is the way we show our love for the good Lord, Mr. Shivershi. What is more beautiful than the flowers? We take the flowers, and with much love we place them upon the walls, and we make others happy with them, and the good Lord, who loves us all, he is pleased.' But here, seeing the sobbing children and the frozen plants, she could not help wiping her eyes upon her apron. The little sufferer on the bed saw this action. Her voice was almost gone. "'Never mind, Mama," she whispered, but the beautiful eyes were filled with tears, for she knew that Mama would mind, that she could not help it. Pete listened to all this attentively. Injun that he was, of course, he could not understand it all. Yet he could hardly help seeing something of the sorrow that the loss of the flowers had brought upon the family. He finished his supper, then slunk out at the door again. Jeff followed him out. "'Little gal ever get well?' asked Pete. "'No, I don't suppose she will,' answered Jeff. "'There ain't no hopes held out for her. Makes it kinder bad, you see. Nice, clever little gal as ever lived, too. Stop in and get your clothes when you come back, will ye?' "'All right,' muttered Pete, as he trotted away toward town." I wonder what Pete was thinking about as he ran through the forest. An Injun's thoughts on any ordinary subject cannot be very deep, yet, when one comes from such a scene as Pete had just witnessed, and when such sad eyes as Marie's haunt one all along a lonely road, even an Injun's thoughts must be worth noticing. Let us imagine what Pete's thoughts were as he shuffled mile after mile through the snow. The scene he had just left rose before his dulled Injun mind. How kind Mrs. Hunt had always been to him! She was the only one that called him Mr. How queer it was that the children should cry because the flowers were killed! How little Marie had looked at him! Somehow Pete could not drive those sad eyes away. They seemed to be looking at him from every stump, from every tree. They were filled with tears now. Could it be because the flowers were frozen? It is no wonder that when the last few lingering village lights came into view, Pete was wondering how he could help matters out. It was quite late, and most of the shops were closed. Only here and there some late worker showed a light. The bar rooms were open full blast, and as Pete glided down the sawdust street it needed all the remembrance of Bill's fist to keep him from parting with a portion of the jingling money for an equal amount of good cheer. But the fist had the best of it, and he went straight on to the last bar room. Surely Bill was right. Nothing but a miracle could stop him. But the miracle was performed, and when Pete least expected it, Pete knew better than to go to the front door of the barroom. He knew how well he and all his race are protected by the government. It had been decided that no one should be allowed to sell liquor to an engine, at least at the regular bar. If an engine, however, could so far lose sight of his personal dignity as to come sneaking in at the back door and pay an extra price for his liquor, whose business was it? Pete knew the way of the bartenders. He had been in the business before. He did not go in at the front door where the higher-bred white men were made welcome, but slunk down an alley by the side of the building, meaning to go in the back way. There was no light in the store next the bar room. It was a milliner's store and had been closed for some hours. But in the back room two women were working away to finish a hat, evidently intended for some village bell's Christmas. Pete stopped in the dark alley for a moment to watch them. A man sat asleep in a chair by the stove, but the women worked on with tireless fingers. The hat was growing more and more brilliant under their quick touches. By their side stood a basket of artificial flowers and bright ribbons. It seemed to Pete that he had never before seen anything so beautiful. Here were flowers, 
Why could he not get some for the little sick girl? It was a severe struggle for the poor engine out there in the dark alley. The thought of the thrashing he would receive on the one hand, and the sad eyes of Marie on the other. What could he do? But even an engine can remember a kindness. It may have been a miracle, or it may have been just the outcropping of the desire to repay a kindness which even an Indian is said to possess. At any rate, the eyes conquered, and Pete braved the fist of Bill. For fear that he should lose courage, he pushed against the door of the room and entered without ceremony. There was a great commotion, I can assure you. The idea of an engine pushing his way into the back parlor of a milliner's shop was too much of a revolutionary proceeding to pass unnoticed. The women dropped their work with a little scream, while the man started from his chair with most violent intent upon poor Pete. "'What ye be after here, engine?' he growled. "'Hump yourself out of here. Get a goin'. But Pete pulled out his money, at the sight of which the standing army of the milliner's store paused. Money has smoothed over many an outrage. It may perhaps excuse even an action on the part of an engine. "'I want flowers,' Pete said, pointing at the basket. "'Give me flowers. I pay.' "'Oh, you want to buy some of them artificial flowers, do ye? This is a pooty time o' night to come flower hunting, ain't it? Just pick out your flowers, and then climb out.' And he held the basket out at arm's length for Pete to select. Pete took a great red rose and a white flower. There was not very much of a stock to select from, but Pete, with engine instinct, selected the largest and gaudiest. "'Them is worth about ten shillings,' figured up the merchant, taking the money from Pete's hand. Pete carefully placed the flowers in the pocket of his ragged coat and started for the door. The milliner's man, rendered affable by the most surprising bargain he had just made, naturally wished to retain the patronage of such a model customer." "'Want anything in our line, just call round and we'll please ye. Only come a little afore bedtime when you come again.' But Pete slunk out at the door and did not hear him. Pete's money was nearly gone, but he had a scheme in his head. He slunk into the back door of the bar room and obtained his jug and what whiskey he could buy with the rest of his money. Then up the street he ran again out of town, stopping only once at the pump to fill the jug to the top with water. Resolutely fastening in the stopper, and not even raising the jug to his mouth, he started for camp at his long, swinging trot with the jug in his hand. Mile after mile was passed over, yet Pete did not stop till Jeff Hunt's cabin came in sight. Hiding his jug behind a log, he crept up to the window and looked in. The light was burning on the table, while Mrs. Hunt sat nodding over her work. She had been mending the clothes so that Pete could take them back with him. Tired out, she had fallen asleep. The box of frozen plants still stood by the table. Pete grinned as he saw them, thinking of the great flowers in his pocket. Marie was asleep. Over her head were hung long clusters of moss with masses of ground pine and red berries. Pete stole to the door and went in. Mrs. Hunt woke with a start, but at the sight of Pete smiled in her weary way. Pete made up his bundle of clothes, and then pulled out the great red rose and the white flower. He laid them on the table with, Flowers for little gal, sick, make her think Christmas, good flowers, all color, no fade, no smell, no wear out. Then, catching up his bundle, he slunk away without waiting for Mrs. Hunt's thanks. When Bill Gammon woke in the morning, he found the jug at the foot of his bunk, but Pete was nowhere to be seen. He had left the jug and fled. The Christmas celebration at Carter's was a very tame affair. Many were the curses showered upon Pete, and had that worthy been present, I doubt if even the thought of the famous miracle would have sustained him in the beating he would have received. But if Pete's conduct produced such a sad effect upon the festivities at Carter's, the joy it caused at Jeff Hunt's cabin made matters even. The glad Christmas sun, glad with the promise of the old, old story, came dancing and sparkling over the trees, and looked down in wonderful tenderness upon the humble cabin. The first bright beams fell upon the bed where little Marie was lying. They showed her the rose and the white flower nestling in the evergreens. The children came and stood in wonder before the rude flowers. How wonderful they were! Where could they have come from? The face of the little girl was more patient than before. The eyes seemed more tender and yet not so sad. Perhaps the glad sun, the same good sun that had looked upon that faraway tomb from which the stone had rolled, whispered to her, as it played about her face, how soon the stone would roll from her life, how soon she would forget all her care and trouble, and enter the land of sunshine and flowers. It may be that the good old Christmas sun even hunted out poor, despised Pete, and told him something of its happiness. 
I am sure he deserved it. Let us hope so, at any rate. End of Indian Pete's Christmas Gift